Okay, hi everyone. My name is Lisa Femia. I am the Senior Symposium Editor at the Journal of Legislation and Public Policy. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and I am honored to introduce a very impressive panel, our first panel of the day, that's going to talk about the actors and businesses on the front lines really dealing with deep fakes. So the platforms, the media organizations, again, the businesses that are you know, potentially publishing or disseminating them. Um, and moderating the panel is Judy Germano, someone I've been very lucky to get to know while planning this conference. Um, she is a distinguished fellow at the NYU Center for Cybersecurity, she, uh, where she leads a cybersecurity task force and a roundtable series of corporate executives and senior government officials talking about issues critical to cybersecurity. Um, she is also the founder of Germano Law, where she advises companies on a variety of things, but including cybersecurity and privacy matters. Um, and Judy was a federal prosecutor for 11 years, uh, previously the chief of economic crimes at the US Attorney's Office for the District of New Jersey. So great experience, we're really lucky to have her here. And Judy, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. If my wonderful panelists can please come on up and, and join me here. We have an exciting and, and impressive um, group of speakers today, and I'm going to let them each introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about how they, they come, to the, come to the topic. But I just want to start, we have Andrew Gulley from Alphabet Jigsaw, Google AI Partnership. Next to Andrew is Till Daldrup from the Wall Street Journal. And then we have Salila Kanum Saludin, uh, Cybersecurity Policy Lead from Facebook, and Corin Fife. Um, who is with Witness, and I thank you all very much for, for being here, and if you could each, I'll, I'll just start with you, Andrew, and we'll move uh, along down the line. Tell us a little bit about your background and why you care about this topic. Sure. Uh, thank you so much, Judy, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, my name is Andrew Gelly. I am uh, one of the research managers at Jigsaw. We are an independent unit within Google. Um, our, can you hear me okay? No? Let me try bringing it a little closer. Excellent, thank you. Um, so as I said, I am from Jigsaw. We're an independent unit within Google. Our mission is to build technologies that help mitigate digital harms online. Our primary interest areas include things like um, online oppression, online harassment, um, censorship online, and also disinformation. We've been thinking about, myself and my team have been thinking about deepfakes for going on two years now, a little less than. And we're really interested in deepfakes, I think, because, as I mentioned, our interest in digital harms, I think deepfakes stem several of those areas. Um, as was mentioned in the keynote, certainly online harassment, uh, de deepfakes can be used in the pursuit of the, that, as well as disinformation. It's clear that deepfakes are being used in that context as well. Um, we've done a lot of work on deepfakes um, from our perspective, both at Jigsaw and within Google. Last year, we released um, one of the first and largest data sets on deepfakes in order to motivate the academic community to build better detectors. We've also done a lot of work on understanding how to communicate the veracity of truth to users and our users in the context of when they might find um, deepfakes online. And we've also engaged very strongly with the academic community in order to understand more about what the threats of deepfakes might actually pose to um, not only our users, but the entire internet. I'm going to stand, not because no. you've said anything offensive, <laughs> but because I felt disconnected from all of you on this side of the room. I couldn't see you. So thank you, Andrew, mm. and Till, if you can uh, right. introduce yourself, please. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Till Daldrup. I am the Training and Outreach Coordinator at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, I'm responsible for all internal news from training there, which includes training on disinformation online, but also training on storytelling, research, coding lessons, and so on. And I first got interested in this topic when I was still a student uh, in spring of 2018. Uh, I was at a conference and I saw that um, Jordan Peele deepfake uh, that Catherine just showed us, and you know, I realized, wow, this is this is huge. And you know, a while after that, I became a research fellow in the, in the journal's R&D team, and we decided to do a deep dive on deep fakes, you know, really 
think about what are going to be the implications for news organizations and what can news organizations do to detect deep fakes and to prevent them from publishing misinformation created with the help of AI. And I wrote a reporter's handbook on the topic. And based on my research with the R&D team, we, uh, we built this uh, media forensics task force in our newsroom, which is a group of 20 to 25 journalists from different departments in the Wall Street Journal, graphics, video, standards and ethics, R&D, training, and so on. Um, it's a core group of journalists that's trained in deepfake detection and uh, the telltale science of AI-generated media. It was short, sort of a shared research, uh, resource in our newsroom. So if journalists ever encounter any videos, images that they think look sort of weird or fishy, they can send them to us and we will make an assessment and get back to them, you know, usually within a day and say, you know, whether they are likely to be fake or, or, or true or, or real. Um, so that's one part of what we're doing, but we're also monitoring research on the topic. Our um, main, I think, one of the biggest things we're doing right now is raising awareness in the newsroom, sort of telling journalists like, oh, this is something that is happening, you should be vigilant, and uh, you know, updating them on the latest developments in the field. Um, as Catherine has already shown, this technology has advanced immensely within the last two years. And so we're training journalists, we're monitoring research, and we're also de testing detection tools because right now there are no comprehensive deep fake detection tools out there for journalists. And you know that's one of the core issues. And uh, we're hoping to see more um, you know, advanced um, detection methods um, from tech companies in the future. I know that Jigsaw uh, a few weeks ago announced that uh, they have a deep fake detection tool for uh, images um, coming out. And so that's very exciting to us. And uh, yeah. Thank you. Samila? Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Salila Salauddin, and I am the Cybersecurity Policy Lead at Facebook. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. I'm really uh, gratified to sort of see the cross-section of students and attorneys, um, people who are interested in this topic, media, etc. I think that the discussion that Catherine teed up uh, with her keynote uh, is why I'm excited to be here, which is to say that the challenges around manipulated media are very diverse. They are not uh, restricted to one particular platform, uh, one particular type of media, uh, and one particular type of audience. And to sort of build on what Andrew and Till, and I think Corin might also be saying, is the Facebook um, thinking around manipulated media uh, has manifested through um, different ways. We announced our manipulated media policy uh, in early January uh, 2020. Uh, under that policy, we focus on misleading manipulated video that is a technical deepfake that may mislead uh, an average person into believing that the contents of the video uh, are something that someone may have said that they did not. In developing that policy, we engaged globally with more than 50 expert uh, communities around the world. Um, Witness was one of those communities. We also had many media organizations with whom we consulted. Um, we were in uh, workshops with the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace and Understanding, where Jigsaw had some excellent research that they presented around the value um, and efficacy of labeling. Um, in those discussions, uh, it was very clear that there is so much that we as a society, as, as platforms and as media organizations and more uh, can be doing. To that effect, I'll touch on this more in, in our discussion, which I hope we'll have. It'll be lovely to have a conversation with this group. Uh, we have a deep fake detection challenge. This is something that Facebook has dedicated over $10 million towards. It is a global consortia of academics and others to produce an open source data set to aid in detection. Uh, as Catherine and others here have said, detection uh, is critical because it helps us to know what is or is not manipulated. In addition to that, we've partnered with Reuters, one of the world's largest global media organizations, to provide a free online training course to journalists around the world uh, for manipulated media detection. Whether we're talking about 
um, the Western world right now that has a lot of sort of robust discussion and technological focus on this challenge. There are also needs in the global south and elsewhere to be able to face this challenge as well. We saw the Rana Ayub video, uh, we saw the Gabon video. Um, there are places far beyond the United States where the impact of this technology will be felt in ways that we have to be very responsible for. And so in making these global uh, programs available free of cost, we seek to be part of that discussion in a meaningful way. Um, there are some other organizations like PEN America, the Arizona State University News Company and Lab Organization, um, and our Digital Literacy Library, where we are trying to make a positive impact in this discussion. Um, but again, grateful to be here and part of this discussion in a meaningful way. Great. Uh, hi. Yeah, I'm Corin Fife. I'm the Program Coordinator for Emerging Threats Research at WITNESS. Uh, also, I want to just give a little shout out to Catherine. Thanks for bringing up the importance of washing your hands, especially at a conference <laughs> like this. I think, I think it's super important that we're all vigilant about, about that kind of thing right now. Um, but yeah, so I come to the deep fakes research from a background in journalism, doing technology reporting for, um, for the past five or six years. Um, and so in that context, I think that it is, it's so important to think of uh, disinformation as a kind of first order problem in addressing all kinds of issues to do with democracy, because without having a clear understanding of what's going on, uh, you know, we really can't tackle any, any other problem, be it climate change or you know, economic injustice, racial injustice, and so on. Um, in terms of witnesses specific research, we as an organization have been for about 25 years helping people using video to document human rights abuses. Uh, in the early days, that was more distributing hardware, handheld cameras and, and so on, providing training. As we've now moved into the digital video age, uh, distributing hardware isn't so much an issue because uh, so many people have smartphones and have recording devices with them. But this kind of this, uh, plasticity of digital video is much more of a concern. Um, and the idea that, in general, video could be seen as not being a, a credible source of evidence if it doesn't come from professional sources. So while we're working to develop policy around deepfakes and respond to it, we also want to ensure that the, uh, the, the, the rights of groups who might be outside of those discussions uh, whether marginalized groups in the US or just other kind of communities around, around the globe are, are represented. Thank you, thank you. And I'm honored to be with such an esteemed group of, of panelists, so thanks for making time for us. But on this issue of deep fakes and disinformation and propaganda, is it really a new big concern or is it just a new flavor of a problem that has existed kind of forever? I mean, if we go back to the art of war, Sun Tzu in 500 BC, said the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. And in the third century BCE, we had Quintus Fabius Pictor talking about the Roman exploits and successes in a very favorable way, um, a little blend of real and not real in some of his history. And that's happened throughout societies, throughout generations. Why is this? so much worse, or is this so much worse? What do you all think of that? Uh, yeah, I can okay. go with some <laughs> initial thoughts. So, um, yeah, so one of the ways that I think about deepfakes and a kind of framework for, for thinking about them is that you can plot things on, a, on an axis, on a two-dimensional space of whether the, uh, whether the content is aimed at a mass audience and deceiving a mass audience, um, and whether, or whether it is micro-targeted, um, and also whether it is uh, so realistic as to be imperceptible, undetectable by, uh, by humans, by algorithms, whatever, or whether it's meant to be just good enough, just kind of passable to fool someone in context. Um, I think that in terms of the, uh, in, so, so some, of those, some of those quadrants, you could say, have been present in disinformation before. So we definitely had large scale um, mass audience propaganda campaigns and so on. Um, and we also have kind of micro targeted campaigns that are meant to be just good enough. You could, you could include something like email spam and phishing and, and so on in that description. Um, some of the new threats are possibly being able to have uh, 
disinformation campaigns or kind of hacking phishing campaigns that are, that are both micro-targeted and hyper-realistic. So the idea that it would be possible to generate a very convincing video or a very convincing audio sample like we, we just heard um, and tailor it to an individual, but in fact tailor it to many individuals at scale, um, but, but personalized to each one. That's something which to me seems like a new, uh, a new dimension of the threat. And I, so I would argue that that is something qualitatively different. I think to build on what Corin said, um, I was in preparing for the discussion today. I was looking over sort of the the wealth of what Facebook and sort of our industry peers and and others in this space witness is sort of a leader on the civil society end, and Catherine is sort of leading the front with a Deep a Trust Alliance. What many are sort of contributing to the discussion, and I think I don't think it's. Um, a new problem, but I think it's a new variation on a problem that has existed for millennia. Uh, there's a quote from Professor Hani Farid, who is um, one of the participants in the Deepfake Detection Challenge, where he talks about the need for having equipped digital citizens because we are now in the age of knowledge and not just in the age of information. And that, that really struck me, and I read it a couple of times, and I wanted to share it uh, for thought here today because what we're dealing with now is not something necessarily that can be affirmed as truth or affirmed as untruth. Uh, in the provenance discussions, for example, when we think about manipulated media videos being targeted against someone's neighbor or against an opponent on uh, the local school's PTA. Those provenance discussions become more and more difficult the more granular we get um, and the more removed we get from sort of powerful spheres of political and other types of influence, such as, such as CEOs of major corporations and so forth. And I think that to make a difference meaningfully, things that the Wall Street Journal and Jigsaw and other members of this space are doing to sort of Pro provide this open source tooling for uh, forensics experts, for others, kind of like what the Deepfake Detection Challenge is seeking to do uh, with its open source efforts, is to enable as many people who seek to be informed uh, to have the tools that they need to be the informed digital citizen. In saying that, I don't mean to burden shift. I, I think we all bear an important uh, responsibility um, but to empower as much as we can and as broadly as we can, whether it's through interstitials to sort of say there's an ind indication that technically this image or this video has been manipulated, or whether empowering a journalist to say, I'm going to take this thing that I have and I'm going to um, run it through some program to, to help me have information as to whether or not I should run this as a cover image on a news story, for example. So I think to, to address this challenge in a new way, um, we do have to have that sort of stakeholder engagement globally in a way that is enabled through as much open source resource sharing uh, that we can provide so that all levels of those who are engaged here, whether they are deep pocketed or not, have a chance to participate and be informed in a way that is powerful and in a way that keeps them um, resilient against manipulation. I think something that's also a little new here is how quickly this technology is developing and our problems of detecting deep fakes. Uh, media forensics experts call it a cat and mouse game or an arms race. As, you know, as soon as a new detection algorithm comes out, the forgers will come up with new methods, new algorithms to come up with even better deep fakes. And we've seen this uh, multiple times. One prominent example, uh, an algorithm that could, could detect eye blinking in deepfakes because that was something that was missing in the very early deepfakes. You would see that you know, the individuals in the videos just wouldn't blink. So media forensics experts at the State University of New York came up with an algorithm that could detect eye blinking in videos and then could say, oh, you know, this, is, this seems to be fake. There's not a lot of eye blinking going on. And two weeks after this algorithm came out, this detection method, the forgers again worked on the algorithms and came up with better detection methods. So what we're really seeing here is how hard it is to detect this technology and also how quickly it is evolving also in the space of audio deepfakes. I think last year we were all surprised when we heard this Joe Rogan example because all examples of audio deepfakes we heard before were sounding very robotic and you could tell right away, well, that's, that doesn't sound real. And now, you know, 
the cadence of the voice, you, you know, the, if you have something like breathing in audio deepfakes now, and it sounds like breathing. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit frightening to see how quickly this technology is evolving at this point. Um, I'll agree broadly with all of my fellow panelists, but maybe take a, just for fun, slightly contrarian opinion. Um, I don't know if I'd necessarily view deepfakes as, at least deepfakes as we see them today in their current incarnation, as a watershed moment, but they absolutely exist on a continuum of new tools and technologies that have enabled the manipulation of uh, multimedia in its various forms um, for at least several decades going back to uh, Photoshop in the early days of those types of tools of, that are of mass market tools that allow uh, multimedia manipulations. The reality is, and what we've certainly learned from our experience of creating large scale deep fake data sets, which inherently have necessitated us to get reasonably good at understanding what the state of the art is in creating deep fakes, um, tells us that it's actually not trivial to create really, really high quality deepfakes that um, are imperceptible or their errors are imperceptible to humans. Um, certainly, as we've all seen, we can find examples of the internet on really high quality deepfakes that seem like they, they might meet that threshold, but they, in large scale data sets, these tend to be hand picked out of your corpus of, um, example, of, of examples that one has created. And they're not necessarily indicative of what is easily producible by um, anyone who lacks the expertise or knowledge to create these types of um, uh, forgeries. Now, certainly, um, it's absolutely true that that's going to change and that may change rapidly over time. But the state of the art right now, I, I don't think is quite as dire as um, some have, have, I think, led us to believe. There's also another subtle point that I want to push on a bit, is I think all of the conversation around the challenges and perceived problems of deepfakes rests entirely or nearly entirely on the assumption that if we're able to create hyper-realistic uh, video, then that is somehow going to fool everybody. That video is inherently more persuasive than other types of fakes or either other types of real content. Um, it's very easy for me to create a forged document or a forged bit of text um, that's trivial and probably would be even more difficult, at least at this point, to detect than it would be a fake video, but somehow we're far more afraid of the, of the situation in which we're able to create hyper-realistic video, but it's not actually at all true whether or not that is an accurate assumption. Um, we've done a little bit of work on this with some colleagues of ours at MIT who tested the perceived um, persuasiveness of video versus textual content. And while we did overall find a small effect size of video being more persuasive, that effect size actually didn't hold in the political context. So while a lot of the conversation about the potential harms of defects are bound up in uh, concerns that could sway elections or change political outcomes, it very well may be the case that humans are far more um, perceptive and skeptical of political content in general, and maybe these effects aren't as strong as we assume they are. So I think there's a lot of nonlinear non effects going on here in these spaces that we still don't fully understand and we're trying to understand better. And um, the, uh, the technology is, of course, going to continue to get better and we remain concerned about this, but I don't know if we're quite at the, at, at the point we are right now that, to say things are dire. Um, and maybe the only evidence we need to see this right now is the fact that I don't know if there's, there, we, we have to, you have to search relatively far to find a um, deep fake that we think has actually had an impact on, on people. Um, setting aside, of course, the severe impacts that deep fakes have had in the gendered violence and sexual assault and non-consensual pornography case. Um, in the political case, at least, it's actually the liar's dividend um, issue that seems to be the most um, problematic uh, consequence of deep fakes right now where people can, uh, and politicians have, uh, attempted to credibly claim that, the, that real videos are not um, um, are fake and they're using that as a justification for various actions. So as Catherine mentioned in her opening remarks, I think it's quite plausible to think that that's actually going to be the largest impact of these, not the, not the hyper-realistic videos themselves. That's a very interesting perspective because my, my experience as a former federal prosecutor is if you put a witness on the stand, it's good. If you have a witness and a photo, it's better. If you have an audio tape, even better. But when you had a video, 
with somebody speaking and acting on the video, that was fabulous evidence. Um, and now, you know, the, the sense is how do we know what to believe? And, and with, as you mentioned, Andrew and Catherine had mentioned the liar's dividend where people can say, oh no, that wasn't me actually in that bank on that day. It's, they fabricated it. Um, despite the sliver of hope that you have given us, Andrew, <laughs> I want to spread out. Is, is it the end of truth or, or are people becoming, um, I guess in a good way, more cynical or is the technology going to catch up with what you have described as a pervasive, persuasive, and quickly evolving problem of fake video and photos and, and other information? Well, I did have, um, I don't know if this directly addresses the, the end of truth aspect, but I did kind of want to come back on something that Andrew just said. Um, because while I, I, I completely agree, it's absolutely true to say that it's very hard to make a video which is going to be totally deceptive of everyone. Um, and that maybe in terms of high level political threats, that means that it's very, different to, uh, very difficult to achieve. But I think in some ways there is a tendency to overly focus on, on those threats and kind of ignore the reality that as um, Catherine mentioned in the introduction, the majority of deepfakes are non-consensual pornography. I, and I think it's important not to just kind of hand wave over that because it, in some ways you could argue, certainly for national security and so on, political threats are, uh, are more pressing. Um, I think if we are talking about this, the non-consensual pornography aspect, again, it comes down to looking at the spectrum of, is something hyper-realistic? Probably not. Um, is something good enough to certainly cause someone a real degree of discomfort, to cause them reputational damage, to cause them uh, psychological and emotional distress. Yes, uh, it, it certainly is. Um, so I, I think the uh, one, other, one other thing to say is that, uh, again, in terms of what type of threats we perceive, uh, Witness is doing a lot of work outside of the US. We've, uh, we've run some workshops in Brazil with some activists and journalists there. Uh, we've run workshops in South Africa. There's one coming in Malaysia just in this coming week. One of the things that we found there is that in countries that are less politically stable, people's main concern is not that they will, uh, is not that their government will be attacked using deepfakes or their politicians will be attacked by foreign actors. Uh, it is that the, this technology will be used to discredit activist groups, anyone uh, engaged in any subversive activity within the country. Um, and if we're talking about Brazil, if we're talking about South Africa or other places in South, uh, Southern Africa, there can often be, um, be killings of journalists, of activists, and so on with impunity. And people are worried that this is just one more tool that will be used to discredit them and lay, uh, lay the groundwork for that. So it's important that when we think about how to regulate it, both um, in terms of legislation and platform policy and so on, we consider all of those kinds of, of threats too. Yeah, I completely agree with that. And in fact, Facebook has participated in those roundtables in Brazil. And uh, two colleagues of mine are going to be participating in the discussion in Kuala Lumpur just this week. Um, I don't think it's the end of truth. Uh, I think that the awareness that these types of manipulation exist, and whether the motivation is to discredit um, a journalist who is a female who is seen as um, a strident critic to certain governmental um, actions. I think that the awareness that we have builds critical thinking to question whether a released video is in fact accurate. And I think the fact that Rana Ayub took it to the UN and globalized the discussion is significant. I think the fact that we're seeing her image here and talking about her example as a way to be aware that this is happening. I think the discussions that Witness is leading on globally uh, bring that awareness and it is critical. I think what concerns me in this space is that there, there, there should not be such a level of distrust that we therefore trust nothing, but uh, we have to sort of have that balance between the tools that are available to us between our own levels of media literacy, between trust in certain um, established news voices globally, 
um, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, um, The Guardian, I mean, other uh, global uh, news outlets. Um, several months ago, was in a discussion with the BBC and also a witness again that brought together stakeholders from uh, around the world, uh, including India, to sort of say, where are there places of truth or sources of truth and information uh, that we can turn uh, where they've taken in those different viewpoints so that we have a, a, a touch point for evaluating whether or not something um, should be seen as valid uh, for consumption as information. Can we talk about, oh, did you want to comment on that before? Yeah, uh, I, yeah. I agree with what Karim and uh, Selina said, and I want to add to that that you know sometimes it also doesn't take advanced technology to have big impact on social media. We've seen that with cheap fakes or shallow fakes uh, that Catherine talked about, which are videos you know that were altered just by using usual you know run-of-the-mill uh, video editing software. Uh, we've seen this with the uh, Pelosi video um, where someone edited in a way that made it seem like she was drunk at a conference and that was shared widely, uh, widely on uh, social media, especially in right-wing circles. So that shows that you know we don't only have to focus on you know the high end of video manipulation deep fakes but also shallow fakes and cheap fakes that are very easy, easy to, um, to generate and to spread online and uh, you know you don't really need um, a lot of graphics power to, to create them. Uh, but I agree we need to have sort of this balance between awareness um, for the issue and not being alarmist about it and that's something that we're also doing dealing a lot in our coverage, you know, how do we raise awareness among our readers for this issue, but without being alarmist and telling them you can't trust anything anymore that you see out there. Yeah, just quickly I'll add, uh, I think that's all exactly right. In many ways, I think the, the discussion about quality and how good are defects can be a little bit of a red herring. It might not actually matter all that much. Not to give the bad actors of the world any ideas, but perhaps one would have as much impact of just releasing um, dozens or hundreds or even thousands of mediocre quality um, defects or otherwise manipulated content rather than one um, astounding quality one. Perhaps you'd get as much uh, benefit out of one than the other. So um, certainly what, what we absolutely need is to encourage the netizens of the world to be generally more skeptical and conscious that this information might be out there and might be trying to um, manipulate you. And I think there is the, that point, Andrew, about how even if an untruth is shown to not be true, people still have in their mind, oh, but I saw it, or oh, I heard mm -hmm. it, and there's that morsel of doubt that gets sown and, and propagated. So on that point, I need you to cheer us up a little bit, because it's still early and it's still Monday. <clears throat> Tell me about some of the technologies uh, that are being implemented to try to address this problem. Uh, sure, if I can jump in on that. Um, so in my organization, Jigsaw at Google, uh, we've done two things. So I mentioned um, last year we had uh, released a data set, an academic data set to try to, just like as Facebook has done. Um, so it's really, the, the entire industry is rallying around this to try to encourage the academic community to um, build better detectors. Uh, not only the academic community, but also hobbyists um, online, like what, as Facebook has, has done with their detection challenge. Um, we've gone uh, another step, uh, as, as Till had mentioned, recently, a few weeks ago, we released a software suite to aimed at, it's only available right now to um, journalists and fact-checking organizations, but its intention is to give these organizations tools, journalists tools, to identify whether or not images, for now we're only starting with images, have been manipulated. Um, Talking to a lot of our uh, colleagues in the fact-checking and journalist space, uh, we began to recognize that this is, and I'm certain Till can speak better to this than I can, but there's a real need among that community to be able to better verify both the accuracy and provenance of uh, various types of media. And so we built a tool called, it's called Assembler. And what Assembler does is it leverages the power of a large number, about six different independently created um, uh, detecting, det uh, forensic image detection systems. So they are designed to detect different types of forgeries and images, such as if somebody's cropped a segment of an image out, or they've spliced something in, or they've copied a region of an image, or they've created a entire um, uh, face or person um, uh, generatively from, a, from an algorithmic model, um, we've developed a system of tools to try to detect these things and make that available to journalists and fact checkers. So uh, we've released this just 
preliminary and uh, alpha um, to, to our trusted partners, and it's uh, an experiment. It's a first step. Um, there's still, we've learned a lot in this process, and there's a lot more still to learn. These models aren't perfect um, by any means. It's an extremely challenging problem. The video, uh, photo forensic space is a really hard problem, but um, we're doing what we can to try to apply our um, ML and AI expertise um, to this challenge. Yes, I think to build on the sort of technical aspects of detection, um, the other parts of this puzzle to consider are the literacy aspects, because as was discussed before, this is a highly adversarial space, and so as soon as you develop a technological capability, your, your uh, adversarial generator, if you will, is going to produce a way to either circumvent that detection or develop some sort of alteration to get around it. And I think in tandem to those uh, open source uh, efforts, such as the Deepfake Detection Challenge, the work that Jigsaw and Google are leading on, et cetera, um, and Twitter and Adobe are also getting into the discussion with sort of content authenticity initiatives as well, um, we think about ways that we can reach out to the consumer of the information. And I, I know I've mentioned this before, but I think it does bear repeating. Um, for example, we have partnered with MediaWise uh, to uh, talk about ways that people can think about how they share, how they forward information. Um, one of the things we haven't touched on is it's not just the technical sophistication or even the lack of sophistication that's a concern here. It's the way that some of this content might reverberate outwards and create noise in a way that is not constructive to society broadly, not constructive to sort of an informed public discourse. Um, although I think Facebook's position is very publicly known of, of supporting different voices around the world, the journalist voice, uh, particularly in the Global South and elsewhere, is a voice that um, Facebook's platform uh, enables, and so we're very mindful of that. Um, we've partnered with PEN America, so to promote a knowing the news kind of awareness. Um, and we've also put sort of free lessons available globally on our digital literacy library. Again, the idea is that not everybody is going to be that technical expert who's going to be able to uh, understand um, the sort of behind the scenes manipulation that is going to occur, but this, this sense and this ability, in addition to what the highly capable, informed, academic community is engaging on right now with uh, the private sector to develop these technical solutions, is to promote um, as much support as we can for the journalist organizations globally and for those users who are getting the information to be able to either think critically about it or run their own tests on it uh, to make informed choices about what they're consuming. And I know in, after our session, we have the fireside chat with Munir Ibrahim of TruePic, who, who focuses on the technology verification at the point of capture. How, how much of the work in this space is done at I'm verifying this video now as I take it so you know that it's authentic versus the work that, um, Andrew, you mentioned that you're doing is just more after the fact verification, right? So if we could just talk about that difference a little bit. Corin, you want to maybe speak to this from uh, your organization's perspective? Yeah. I think you're well suited. Uh, yeah, can sure. Jump on. Um, so, yeah, Witness has been involved in some, uh, some discussions recently with, uh, uh, with Adobe, who is leading on uh, something called the Content Authenticity Initiative, um, trying to develop standards around uh, provenance and ensuring the, the integrity of media from capture through, uh, through distribution. Um, so it, it's, certainly, uh, it's certainly something that some big players in the field are, are working on at the moment and uh, possibly we'll, we'll soon see uh, new standards for the way that media is distributed and uh, media is tracked. Um, I think our, our position throughout that has also been that whilst uh, ensuring the, the veracity of media is a, a really key part of, of the problem, um, we also don't want it to exclude any groups that, uh, any, any people who are not able to use the same kind of software. So, for example, one of the, uh, one of the possible uh, dilemmas that Adobe is and others are considering at the moment is, do you need to have an unbroken chain of provenance in order for, uh, for media to count as verified? So does that mean that someone has to have used a, a certain app to capture it, uh, and then at each stage of the chain, 
uh, every every kind of transformation or uh, every part of the distribution process has been accounted for. Um, that's all well and good, but that could also give rise to the possibility that there is certain content that might be very valuable. It might document, you know, police brutality, some kind of human rights abuse, war crimes, or or, or whatever it might be, that hasn't been involved in the process or the chain has been pro broken along the line. Um, and so we certainly do also need ways to validate and to kind of onboard content into uh, an authenticity track rather than relying on this, this kind of chain at, at each stage. And so at the Wall Street Journal and you also, there's a media consortium similarly that works to collectively authenticate videos and images? Yeah, and we are very excited about, about all these things that are happening on the detection side but also on the provenance side because obviously as journalists we are in no way media forensics experts. There are only so many things you can do to verify content, so you can do you know, reverse image search, or you can you know, find the original of a, of a, of a photo or, or a video, because all deepfakes, are, or most deepfakes are based on you know, content that is already out there. Um, and you know, we're testing detection tools that are, that are being developed right now, but uh, you know, there's no comprehensive tool out there for journalists to really verify um, images and videos uh, right now. So uh, you know, we're very excited about everything that's happening in this field. So Catherine left up her questions for the day slide, which is great, because one of the, the key questions are how are stakeholders coming together, which you alluded to in this answer. But I also want to address from a policy perspective, how are stakeholders coming together, and who, who is responsible for this uh, concern of deep fakes? So Leela, you want to start with that one? Um, yes, I think that we've sort of been having this discussion a bit. Um, I think that the, the stakeholders are global, as I've said a few times. Uh, I think that the sort of diverse panel here shows you a diverse set of stakeholders. Um, one, one example, I think, uh, to illustrate how many voices matter in this discussion is the uh, I think more quiet discussion that's happening right now around um, typologies of manipulation. I don't know if people here in the audience are familiar with um, some of the efforts that are underway right now. Um, the Washington Post has been public about what they're doing. I'm not sure if the Wall Street Journal is also engaging in sort of typology discussions, but it really is a good example of um, stakeholders and who matters. So Facebook uh, has more than 50 um, fact-checking organizations that we're partnered with around the world. They all belong to the International Fact-Checking Network. These are fact-checkers with expertise in more than 40 global languages. Um, and the idea initially with some of this typology thinking on like what are different kinds of manipulation and how do we use them to apply to what we might be fact-checking for um, platforms or for news organizations or for citizen organizations, et cetera, is that initially some of the voices influencing how those typologies should be developed were from one particular community. But when you think about the ways that these typologies could influence, for example, product solutions in how uh, media might be categorized or labeled online or might influence how uh, media organizations talk about the manipulation that they encounter and cover. It became and is becoming, because this is a present tense uh, undertaking that is happening as we speak, it is becoming more and more clear that we need more voices to influence how those typologies develop. So first draft, the partnership on AI, witness, others are influencing those discussions. And I think that um, the outcome of that will be hopefully um, a product that is beneficial to the ecosystem as a whole. Um, in saying that, I will caveat my remarks by saying I, I don't necessarily think that there should be like one global typology that we all agree with and have consensus around. I don't mean to say that because that's difficult, but we can have something that is a touch point, that has the input and wisdom of many different perspectives to make it stronger and better and potentially more widely applicable uh, for the benefit of all in a way that is, is very good for the ecosystem. Warren, were you going to say something? I wasn't sure. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I can. I'll see if any of the other two had anything to, to add there first. But um, 
Otherwise, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, Facebook is doing some, some great work around this. Uh, Twitter also has uh, put out a policy recently on uh, manipulated media, and uh, uh, YouTube has some policies in place as well. Um, Witness has been, been broadly supportive of all of those and, and um, also leveled, leveled some criticisms. Um, I think that one of the really important things, uh, the, the points that we're trying to make, is that the, um, you, you know, the policies can, can be great, can be kind of perfect or as perfect as they can be, but in, enforcement is sometimes a different question um, and is a really important point to focus on. I think that um, making a comparison between Facebook and, and Twitter, uh, Twitter just with... Uh, with fewer resources, has not developed um, language teams to quite the same extent. Uh, I, I know that when we were uh, delivering the workshop in Africa and talking to, to people there about how they saw uh, misinformation in general and deepfakes, they were very aware of the fact that Twitter didn't really have a, a regional office, didn't have much of a, a presence there. And that, uh, even without any policy having been enforced at that point, it gave people concern that the company would be able to get it right and to be able to make these calls, which always uh, rely very much on, on context, um, particularly if you're talking about satirical use cases, you know, you're talking about irony, humor, and so on. These things are very culturally specific, and it's not just about a direct translation of, of the language. So, um, yeah, it's, it's been great to see these policies roll out, but development of uh, regional knowledge, language, cultural knowledge, and so on is uh, super important for the way that they're actually enforced. Yeah, I think in terms of enforcement, we're going to see platforms have to make very difficult uh, decisions on videos and images on their platforms. We've seen that, I think, last week or the week before with the Mike Bloomberg video uh, from the Nevada Democratic debate, um, where they, his campaign actually edited the video to make it seem like the pause after this question, I think I'm the only candidate that has founded a business, am I right? You know, they extended that silence of the other candidates with crickets chirping in the background. You know, is that satire or is that actual disinformation? You know, Twitter, I think, said that according to the new policy, which is going to roll out March 5th, um, this would have been flagged. I think Facebook said that this would not have been flagged on their platform. So we're going to see very interesting decisions that Facebook, Twitter, and other platforms will have to make in the future. Till, that's an excellent example because it brings into one of the points that I wanted to just press on a little bit further with all of you is this, um, what I sense is a tension. We have the First Amendment right, we have censorship concerns, we have disinformation concerns. Who are you and who's the you? Is it, is it Facebook, Twitter, Google, YouTube, to tell the users and the viewers what to watch or not watch, what to believe or not believe, and where do we draw the lines in an appropriate and responsible way? Who should be drawing those lines? Where do we draw the lines? And how do we determine, is it just art? Is it satire? Is it just something that you should flag as 20% reliable or 50% reliable based on algorithms or artificial intelligence so people can judge for themselves but not risk a censorship? What do you think of those issues of how do we balance this responsibility and understanding the harm that a lie put out there, even when found to be a lie, still permeates as such, versus the not putting it on perhaps the platforms to tell us what to believe or not believe or watch or not watch? Thoughts on that? I have a few. Um, I guess the, the first thing I'll say is just maybe open the squirrel hatch here and say, <laughs> I'm, I'm just the researcher, not the policy person. Um, but, uh, so we started, our, as I mentioned, we started looking at deepfakes nearly two years ago. And from the beginning, we had this originating principle that we recognize there certainly will be cases in which it's going, it will be deemed appropriate either by a platform society or just the general consensus that we should leave this material online. And there will be cases where um, the opposite is true, where the broad consensus of either the platforms or just the general public would deem that it is in the interest to remove this material from our platforms or other platforms. And so we were really interested in, A, determining, well, can we detect these things first and foremost? But even, even, 
pardon me, even assuming we are able to detect things, let's just hypothesize with perfect accuracy, there will be those former cases where we choose to leave this material online, but nevertheless, we feel that it probably would be in the public's interest to inform them that this uh, content had been manipulated. So we embarked on doing some research experiments, um, which uh, Salila had um, briefly mentioned. Uh, we, we've talked about it in a few forums, um, although haven't uh, uh, published uh, just yet. We're working on that. Um, which is, how do we effectively communicate this veracity and effectively communicate this truth to, to users? So for instance, in the example where we would have um, a defake or other types of synthetic media deemed permissible by some platform policy, um, how would we effectively communicate nevertheless to the user that this had indeed been manipulated? Um, or it might in be attempting to deceive you. And we learned two really, I think, interesting and profound things from the, the research that we did, which is certainly limited and, and, and we need to do more of. But the first was that language is really important and really matters when trying to communicate this information to users. That may seem obvious, but um, I don't think we quite understood how important it could be. So for instance, in the first round of experiments we ran on this topic, we were using the label, the term fake. We were telling users this was fake and we were asking people their perceptions of whether or not they believed us um, when we told them or they thought it was uh, true when, when we said this was fake. And we found a very low percentage of respondents um, answering yes. Uh, I think only 30, nearly 30, a third roughly um, uh, of the sample of people in our first experiment when told something was a deep fake um, uh, answered back to us, yes, we, we do indeed um, believe this was fake. Um, and it turns out that didn't work well. What actually worked really, really well was when we used the term manipulated. Um, we, asked, we ran roughly the same experiment, but we just changed the language a little bit. And the, we found almost in our results the inverse was true. Now nearly two-thirds of people kind of believed our label, believed our claim, and, and only a third um, didn't, which I think is really encouraging because that means we're definitely on the right track. It also means about a third of people um, didn't believe us, which I think is still a non-insignificant uh, percentage of, of users. So there's clearly more work to do. Um, but it does, I think, emphasize the, the importance of nuance and the importance of language in communicating these things and in ways that, that might not be um, obvious. Yes, uh, agree. I think that um, the point made earlier about Camille Francois's work around actor behavior and content I think is relevant to what we're talking about right now because there's not sort of a monolithic approach here. Um, Facebook, uh, late in 2019, we took down a network uh, a coordinated and authentic behavior network where um, actors were using AI-generated photos to conceal their fake accounts. Um, and we, in our efforts against those types of actors, uh, took that uh, network of accounts down. When you're talking about behavior, um, often in the behavioral discussions, it's not necessarily the content that's at issue. The content is not necessarily false or real. Uh, it might actually be uh, lifted from verified and trusted news sources, but rather the behavior is hiding the actors who are sort of perpetuating those messages in a way that could seek to foment uh, discontent or corrupt public debate. And so that is warranting of a certain type of enforcement action. When you're talking about content, um, there are ways to go against content. So in the misinformation space, as opposed to the disinformation space, um, there are responses where removal, as Facebook has determined it, I know that the different platforms and others have different approaches, um, where it touches on, for example, voter interference or suppression or, or census uh, concerns. That content, or real world harm for that matter, that content will be removed. But for other types of content, it's sent to a third party fact checker who can rate it and it will be subject to a down ranking. And for those sites that continue to post that kind of information that is confirmed as false by a third party fact checker, those pages will lose monetization privileges, will lose advertising privileges, and will face consequences. And so it's this combination of response that is an intersection between product friction for the people who are seeking to engage in that kind of distribution of misinformation and um, 
sort of real world consequences, such as loss of revenue, such as loss of eyeballs in terms of viewing that type of content. Um, I think that those um, varied solutions are how we create challenges for the adversary in this space um, to make it difficult because I think one commonality that's coming through um, is that there's not one solution. If we did have one solution, it wouldn't last very long because this area is rapidly evolving. And so we need different ways to tackle the problem, leveraging uh, the information that we all bring to bear based on the parts of this uh, complex um, development that we have deepest visibility on. I, okay, if yes, I can just add one please. thing quickly. I sort of apologize in advance because I'm going to make a point that Salida is probably just a better place to, um, to, to make and to explain. But so you mentioned the, the, the First Amendment, you know, and, and comparisons there. How do we decide whether something is acceptable or not? Who should make those decisions? Well, in the case of the First Amendment, you know, we have the text of the First Amendment and then various different test cases that establish precedent and, and so on um, to, to really find the bounds of how that is applied in real life. The really interesting thing is that Facebook now is moving towards uh, a system where content can also be uh, judged in a, in a similar way by establishing an independent board of, uh, I forget the, the exact terminology, but uh, an, an independent board of... Uh, board of directors to whom content removal and content moderation decisions can be appealed. Um, and in the case that those uh, appeals are upheld or overturned, that policy can then be applied more broadly across the platform. So um, yeah, that it, it's, uh, it's kind of interesting, but also I think very appropriate that now we, we have these, these companies, these tech companies being the same size as or, or bigger than many countries in terms of user base, they're actually starting to adopt more governance procedures that are taken from uh, constitutional law. I, I don't work directly on the oversight board, but I think that's a really important point. Um, you know, Facebook has gone on the record uh, to say that we welcome and would be grateful to participate in discussions on on how to regulate and think about this space. I think that, you know, when we say the First Amendment, we're being very United States specific, and these are global discussions that we're having, and so it's important to take into consideration um, other frameworks. That said, uh, voice is extremely important, and one of the learnings from the Oversight Board and some of the initial efforts to launch that um, has been the deep value brought by different members of the board who come from different parts of the world and how content is viewed and engaged with differently. I think that's a very, very good point to raise. So absolutely, I think being involved in that discussion is something that we would welcome. I have one more question. Admittedly, it's a compound question, so I'm sticking two questions in, and then I'm going to turn it to the audience, so get ready if you all have questions to ask. Um, my question is, just before we got started this morning, I was speaking with someone who is at an environmental organization, and it made me appreciate the depth of this issue of how many different cross sectors are implicated. And we've talked about human rights concerns and political concerns, but there's environmental concerns with, with deep fakes and, and disinformation, as well as um, corporate branding and um, individual reputations that can impact companies and impact stock price. And, how, um, and health concerns, as we're all, thankfully, Catherine telling us, washing our hands, especially this week, but, um, and hopefully always, but anyway. Uh, so how much is corporate America, to, from your perspective, aware of this issue and how it is on their doorstep or about to be on their doorstep and working with you to, to address these concerns? And with that, the second part of my question is, do you think it's, it's going to get worse, or are we moving in the right direction of tackling the concerns of deep fakes? Anyone? <laughs> Corin, you ready? Yeah, well, I mean, I, th I think, yeah. So what, I mean, Witness doesn't do uh, that much work with, with corporate America, but, um, I don't know. I, I think I kind of want to answer yes to both of your questions. Like, yes, it is getting worse. At, and at the same time, yes, we are, we are getting better in, uh, in dealing with it. I mean, clearly the technology is evolving very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, in that sense, we are going to see new and emerging threats and a continuing development of this threat. Um, 
I think, I think something that will be really important in dealing with it actually is, um, you know, putting my journalist hat on, looking at, at um, particularly strengthening local news and ability to respond. Because whereas, you know, Wall Street Journal has a fantastic team, uh, New York Times, also world-leading visual investigation teams, um, all of the, the big media outlets have the ability to put time, resources, and expertise into it. Uh, but as the deepfakes technology becomes democratized, becomes more and more accessible and user-friendly, it is going to be uh, used to target people at the level of local government, at the level of uh, you know, local enterprise and so on. And so it is really important that these local news outlets also have the ability to, to respond. Um, but that's why you know, it's also great that Andrew and people like the, the Jigsaw team are building tools that are then going to be um, broadly usable by these groups. And just to jump on that, yeah, I, I think that's something that we're thinking about thoroughly too. Um, obviously, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and other places have a lot of resources, um, so they can tackle this issue appropriately. But uh, we've heard from uh, organizations like First Draft that during the election cycle 2020, it's going to be local news organizations that are going to be targeted by, um, by malicious actors because they have less resources. So what we're focused on is also sharing our knowledge. You know, we we're, we're want to partner with other news organizations and we want to share what we learn through articles or training sessions uh, to prepare them what's to come. And in terms of corporate America, I'm not part of, part of corporate America, so I don't know if I can answer that question. But what we are seeing at the Wall Street Journal, we've got um, a new uh, cybersecurity uh, vertical um, that um, gathered a lot of interest um, from uh, from companies that are actually asking these questions, what should we do about deepfakes? And we've seen the case that Catherine has showed this morning that deepfakes are you know, being used to actually defraud companies. So I think people are waking up to this issue, but I think there's still a long way to go until uh, companies are really prepared for all that's to come. Um, yeah, I'm, I think I'm optimistic. I mean, that's why we have invested quite a lot of you know, time and resources into developing tools, like I mentioned, like Assembler. Um, you know, if I thought there was no hope here, there would probably be a little use in us um, uh, investing those resources and trying to develop techno uh, technology solutions that help detect these types of um, manipulations and forgeries. That being said, this space, as we've mentioned, as has been mentioned, is an adversarial one. It's been described as an arms race. I think that's accurate. So um, we're constantly in a cat and mouse game between what we can do and then what bad actors are trying to do to um, uh, circumvent the systems that we've developed. Um, but we're, we're optimistic we can try to make a dent in it nonetheless, and um, we're not going to go down without a fight. So we like, um, yes, I think to, to build on what was said, I'll mention again the sort of Reuters manipulated media training that we have, sort of partnering with a global organization, one global organization partnering with another global organization, but making it available to all. Um, one thing that I did not mention is that that training course is available in English, in Spanish, in Arabic, and in French, with more languages hoping to be onboarded in the coming year to really make it as widely available as possible. Um, I think the point about local news organizations um, being rife for this, I think that that's something we will increasingly see, to, uh, increasingly see especially as the ease with which to create uh, this technology becomes more prevalent. Um, but I also think along with that sort of uh, vernacularization, if you will, of the technology as it becomes more commonplace, um, we will also uh, build resilience just by the fact that it's out there and we're aware. I don't know if that's too optimistic and I apologize if I sound that way. I don't mean to be glib, but I think that as this becomes more prevalent and as we become more aware, um, we will become stronger against it. That said, uh, those that have the resources to share the learnings, to make things open source, um, and to engage in a responsible manner globally uh, should do so. Um, and to the extent that governments um, can support that through um, grants for innovation, for example, to universities, um, to civil society organizations and others to bring different voices into the discussion and tackle those challenges in a diverse way, I think would be um, probably welcome. Uh, we know that uh, innovation um, and the internet itself 
uh, was enabled through some of those government efforts to fund innovation, and I think we should really uh, consider what opportunities are there. Um, and you know, some are probably aware DARPA is doing a lot of work in the manipulated media space, and they are bringing in academics and others uh, to leverage those learnings as uh, as deeply as they can. Thank you. So we have some time for questions. Yes, sir. Can you use the outside voice? <laughs> or I'll repeat it, as long as I can hear you. OK. So my question is probably more along the lines for Andrew and Hill, though anyone obviously can chime in. At the beginning of this session today, um, and I apologize if I get names wrong, Catherine talked about uh, the different types of deep fakes, face swap versus lip sync. We can probably say that things like lip sync, which are prepared productions, are probably more likely to fool uh, your detection tools than say things that are done, for lack of better words, on the fly. I guess my question is, we already know processing power is really commercially available. How, in your estimation, commercially available are some of these other tools to produce some of the deep fakes, especially things like, I guess you could call it a better version of the Jordan Peele Obama video. Like how easy would it be for me as a novice uh, with, with no true background to create something? So in case folks over there did not hear, how, how readily available are the tools for creating deep fakes? How easy is it for folks who may not have uh, high levels of technological capability to create deep it's fakes? Specifically a high level deep fake. A I mean, quality one. one. It's pretty easy to pick that apart. I'm talking something yeah. more along the lines of the Jordan Peele Obama, maybe a better version of that. Panelists? Sure, um, I'll take this one. So you're quite right in that there's a many different ways to, or rather to rephrase it, that deepfakes has become a catch-all term for a large number of different techniques that have largely, although not entirely, came out of um, academia um, in order to create uh, or use generative models in order to synthesize the likeness of somebody, and that has given rise to deepfakes. So some of the methods that you mention um, use uh, neural networks and are readily available and we can you, you can probably go online t today and uh, download these models and create um, deep fakes uh, most likely it's going to be the variety of those which um, synthesize an entire face and swipe that entire face onto um, the the base portrait of somebody else um, the other types of techniques which may um, it's been um, referred to in the literature as puppeteering techniques for instance you'll film um, my face doing something and that will, and then we'll have a computer um, on the fly in real time uh, manipulate your face to make the my facial expressions, or make your face match my facial expressions. Those are done with a lot more um, kind of traditional uh, graphics te techniques and 3D modeling techniques that are much harder for, I think, the lay person to um, recreate, although they, they, I suppose they could uh, painstakingly uh, try to recreate what's been described in the literature papers on those, but they haven't been publicly released um, in a way that makes them readily available. Um, so there's a certain class of these models that I say is very readily available. Um, to give you an anecdote, the main GitHub repository for the face swapping techniques that I described is actively maintained by a group of hobbyists who are just who are interested in the problem of deepfakes, and they're incorporating the latest advances in the literature into that repository on an ongoing basis. But they're not incorporating everything and. Um, there are certain things that are not currently accessible to um, the lay audience. Oh, I also I should mention, um, just quickly, uh, there's also been a somewhat of a commercialization of this space as well. There's actual actual companies who have who are selling this, um, uh, creating a deepfake as a service, so you can actually just go buy them as well. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that last point is exactly what I was going to, to say. So uh, there was the, the blog post on the NYU uh, Law blog by Henry Adjter of Deep Trace Labs based in, in the UK, uh, one of the foremost organizations in detecting deep fakes. Uh, there was a co-author too whose name I'm, I'm forgetting. But uh, yeah, two things, important things that came out of that. One, just as Andrew said, the commoditization of, of deep fakes. So 
How easy is it for you as a non-technical user to produce a very high quality deep fake? It's, it's probably kind of tricky. How easy is it for you to commission someone to create a high quality deep fake? That's pretty easy and it's not very expensive either. Um, so that's one thing. The other important thing to note is the, uh, the channels where this takes place. Um, which, another point that Catherine made earlier in the day was that distribution is an important element of those. So um, in some situations, these happen through open forums, which are fairly easy to, uh, to, to analyze and track and, and so on. But increasingly, uh, what's being used to distribute and solicit deepfakes are closed messaging apps, um, WhatsApp, Telegram, other things like that. Uh, that creates a really dif uh, difficult problem for content moderation because these, are, these apps and their encrypted groups within them are pretty much opaque even for the companies that produce the apps. Um, and this, this is kind of a bigger problem for journalism and fact-checking in general, which is that it's very difficult to debunk rumors that are being spread through WhatsApp because, you, I mean, one, you might not be able to see what the rumor is, but two, you don't really have any entry into the group in order to provide a contextual uh, debunk or fact check or whatever that occurs in the same space and is going to be relevant to the people consuming the information. So, um, yeah, I think as far as the production and distribution goes on, uh, as far as that goes, this uh, use of closed messaging apps is probably something that we need to watch out for. So I can take two questions at the same time. Um, we'll, we'll do you, ma'am, and, and, and you. OK, so if you can give your question, and then you, we'll get your question. Um, go ahead, please. I just oh. Hi, thank you, so, thank you so much for today. I just concluded a fellowship at the World Economic Forum. And one of the, a lot of the work that I'd done was focused on misinformation, um, specifically targeting the older adult population. I had hosted an event um, in early December called um, The Art of Creative Transformation. And one of my sessions, The Art of the Fake, was actually uh, a conversation. We were looking specifically at Professor Hani Farid. He unfortunately wasn't able to uh, attend, but we ended up getting um, Adobe and The New York Times to come in and talk because they had just announced their partnership on content authenticity. What, what, what I was disappointed about was because I really wanted Professor Fareed or even Professor Hal Lee, who is uh, a, a colleague of his, who had been doing a lot of the work um, around deep fakes to really talk about um, the ethics around the people who are building these, the, the content or the products that are, that are making the deep fakes. Um, what are we doing about slowing down the ethics around the consequences that we're teaching the academic institutions that are developing these products? Aside from the hobbyists, aside from the people who are doing this, and I'm not even talking about the ones who have malicious intent to undermine society, but what are we doing at the academic level to tell the students and the researchers who are developing these to slow down, either slow down or to think about the consequences that their actions have on, on this? Thank you. Great, and then, and your question, please? Yeah. Thanks, Judy. Um, this is actually a follow-up to your last question that you mentioned regarding the private sector. To what extent, if we could just flesh it out a little bit more, have we seen deepfakes used to conduct fraudulent transactions in companies to enter, enter a company's enterprise or just like an IT environment to harvest credentials? To um, conduct all kinds of transactions that are unauthorized what have you seen in um, various IT group or companies IT groups or have you heard to address this both in terms of technology but it also in terms of like developing training policies and procedures what do you what have you seen um, what, what's like the biggest delta in that regards as well and I know that question is an excellent uh, foreshadowing of panel number two which is coming so later. But in, in the quick minute that we have, if, if you folks want to just address those two questions, one or the other. I can touch on them briefly and then defer to fellow panelists. But on the, um, on the sort of financial sector questions, I, I can't speak to that directly. But I will say that when we were in the policy development process, we spoke to stakeholders around the world and also from um, across industry. And one of the really illuminating discussions that we had was with um, a major financial actor um, headquartered in the United States uh, that is deeply concerned about the audio aspect of manipulation here because of the example that Catherine gave in her presentation, that you would have um, like within 
an organization, for example, um, an audio saying, I'm authorizing X, Y, Z. Or, for example, another variation is a, an auto call to users of a particular service to say, you need to do X in order for such and such. I mean, that's sort of a variation on the scam uh, that we're probably aware of. The FTC has a lot of actions that sort of prohibit those types of things. But those were some of the um, real world cases that were brought to our attention in terms of the concerns that we need to face. And I think that um, that's an area where we probably want to have more discussion. Because um, I think the pivot right now is very much on like platforms and media organizations, but there are definitely concerns in the financial sector, I think, that bear scrutiny. Um, on the other question about the uh, ethical implications of some of what's happening on the sort of academic and partnership side, absolutely agree that um, ethical considerations are paramount. Um, we have a sort of robust um, ethical policy team that deals with many of these questions. Um, on the open source side, one of the considerations that has been had is how how open source do you make it to make sure that it's as beneficial as possible without letting the bad actor take advantage of the information that's being shared? Um, and you know, there's a lot of debate right now around that because when you make information available to all, it's really available to all. Like those who will use the information for purposes to make detection better and those who will use the information to say, ah, this is how they're detecting now. Here's how I'm going to circumvent that. And so I think that there is no easy solution to how that should be done, but vigilance and scrutiny by those who are part of the broad global stakeholder community to make sure that things are getting right. Uh, and I think scrutiny by the media too, to make sure that things are being reported effectively. Um, and by civil society as well is critical to make sure that we have accountability um, from all players in this process. And with that, I really want to thank you all so much for, for working for the good and helping us on this. <laughs>